All right, we did all of our information gathering. We've done the site survey. It is time to create that low level design. In this video, we're going to just do an overview of what this design process looks like so that we can know what to expect when we start doing wireless designs. All right, so we have all of the information that we gathered as part of our prepare and plan phases. We also performed the site survey. And so we know all of the RF requirements, in other words, the number of access points and where they're going to go. And so now it's time for us to deliver the low level or detailed design plan. This is going to be a set of documentation that we're going to deliver for the purposes of making a decision. This might, by the way, also include some kind of presentation. And as I always say, it doesn't matter whether this is us as IT consultants or us on an IT team, either way, we are typically not the decision makers if we're also doing the technical design. If we are, then hey, this is a cut and dry uh, situation. I'm just going to approve my own designs. But chances are we have other stakeholders that are going to need to understand this. And this is why documentation and presentation are going to be very important. Now I know us as engineers, these are two things that we're not always typically very comfortable with. However, I highly encourage everyone who's watching this to uh, put a little bit of effort into presentation skills as well as being able to write well, because these are non-technical skills. These are what we call soft skills that go a long way towards developing us towards a lifelong career as a network architect. It can't always be knowing the technical differences between wireless LAN controller A and wireless LAN controller B. If this is all we end up focusing on as solutions architects, then we're gonna miss a big part of what it means to be in this role. Now, fortunately for us, this is not on the exam. So we don't need to worry about this. This is just more of something that I encourage us all to participate in as far as real life is concerned. So now that we have all this info, what kinds of things go into our design? Well, we do need to start with the individual components. And one of the biggest components in a Cisco lightweight wireless uh, design is going to be the wireless LAN controller. This is huge. We need to decide, for example, are you deploying a hardware controller or are we deploying some kind of software controller? Are we going to go with an embedded wireless controller for a smaller site? Or we're going to go with the 9800-CL for deploying into a private or public cloud. We also need to decide where in the network this is going, especially if it's a hardware solution. This might be going into the distribution layer or the core layer or possibly the data center. And we've indicated before that this matters a lot because if we are tunneling data through the wireless LAN controller, then our clients are actually gonna show up wherever the wireless LAN controller is. And if that's inside the data center, we might've just bypassed firewalls that were supposed to be inspecting client traffic going into and out of the data center. And so let's be very careful if we're tunneling our data traffic, which in most cases we will be. We also need to figure out the high availability portion of this. Our wireless LAN controller environment needs to stay online. And so are we going to take advantage of stateful switchover? Are we going to have redundant wireless LAN controllers in different locations? And also we need to make sure that licensing is all set and not just licensing, I suppose, but also sizing. And that's especially true once again, if we're deploying hardware wireless LAN controllers. Now, naturally we also need to make sure we're getting the correct access points in place. You know, do we need six gigahertz radios? Is that what we decided as part of our you know, info gathering? Can we get away with dual five gig uh, bands? And so that might be an option, or can we go with single five gigahertz radios? Do we need, by the way, the Cisco RF ASIC? I would argue in most cases, absolutely. This is the value of Cisco and we want to be leading with this. However, did we decide that we don't actually need this in this environment? Maybe it's a small, medium business type of situation. Regardless, we need to make sure that we are meeting the minimum specs for our design. If we're not meeting the minimum specs, then this is not a valid design whatsoever. So let's make sure we're meeting the minimum and possibly then uh, adding some other uh, maybe optional features into the mix that could create at least some conversations around whether or not that's a good idea. Now, we've also mentioned a few different times that we need to consider the switching environment. And so this isn't just about wireless, at least in the real world. I don't expect to be asked a whole lot of questions on the ENW LSD about the switching infrastructure. However, in real life, we need to ask questions. For example, does the current switching infrastructure support multi-gig? Does it support the right version of PoE? In other words, do we have PoE plus on here? Do we have PoE plus plus? Do we have Cisco's UPoE? And so we covered these earlier on in the course as well. And importantly, also the power budget, because it's one thing to say that we support UPoE, but if we're deploying a whole lot of UPoE access points, you know, if each switch only supports a limited power budget, then we might run out of power really fast. 
And then there is the other category, which is pretty much just everything else that we should be talking about as part of a design that we might not actually think about to start with. For example, do we need to include any copper or fiber patch cables? Especially if we're connecting our wireless LAN controllers into larger switches at 10 gig, 40 gig, even 100 gig, which is supported, what type of connectivity are we using there? Uh, furthermore, do we need copper connectivity to the access points? A lot of times when we're installing the access points in the ceiling, the copper run is going to be terminated into a female connector. And so we'll need a patch cord to connect our access point in. And by the way, is that CAT6A? Is it some other type of connector? So let's make sure that we've got the right cables there. Uh, furthermore, by the way, who's pulling all of these runs? Is that going to be us? Are we responsible for that? <laughs> are we hiring somebody to do that? And so let's not just make an assumption there that those runs are just going to magically show up. And by the way, if we're doing it, do we have the tools in order to accomplish this? Or do we need to go purchase some of these? And if we have labor involved, whether it's our own labor or somebody else's labor, do we have that scope of work document that's going to define what's being done and what's not? So if we are a consultant going into a shop, we probably better create a scope of work defining what we're doing and what we're not. And conversely, if we're a Cisco IT shop, do we have an SOW internally to say how we're doing things for our own project management? And do we have an SOW from our consultant, which might be defining for us what we're expecting them to do? And so ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to create the final design deliverable. And so for example, we're going to have the overall design document that talks about the what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're also going to have the associated bills of materials or possibly quotes, depending on the situation. Either way is fine. We need to understand what the price is as well as what we're getting. That's what the bill of materials would list, although the quote should list that as well. We also need to make sure that, uh, once again, we've got the scopes of work in there, if we have any of those, as well as just anything else that's relevant to the overall design. And so all of this needs to go, ultimately, to the decision makers. Maybe that's our bosses. Maybe that's a customer. Maybe that's uh, the team. Maybe you or me, whoever put this together, is actually going to be part of a committee that makes this decision. But in the end, we've got to make sure that we have everything together so that the right decision can end up being made as far as the design that we created. So ideally, at this point, we've done our due diligence and hopefully the decision's made to go to implementation, but we can only control what we can control. And so that's why we need to make sure we're controlling all of this, regardless of what decision is made around the implementation itself. So as far as this part is concerned, we want to make sure that we are creating a formal design document. That needs to have everything in it that is justifying the purchase of this solution, but also making sure that we give the reasons why we're specking things out so that if questions are asked later, we can refer back to this document because we might also forget why we specced out uh, this particular type of fiber cable or what have you. And so we're going to assemble all these documents, the bomb, the quote, the uh, have should have all of the components in it, whether it's wireless LAN controllers and access points and switches and cables. All of these things should be part of the uh, document that we put together. And then we're just, we're going to hand it over and say, okay, here you go. And maybe there's a presentation involved, or maybe it's truly just a, an email or physically handing things off. But ultimately it's up to the decision makers at that point to read things through and maybe get back to us with questions. But ultimately we respect their decision and hopefully, hey, hopefully we end up moving on to an implementation. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.